national level. Thank you for joining us and members of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus today. Before we get started, if you're a member of the press and wish to ask a question, please message me in the chat box identifying which media outlet you're representing and we'll accommodate as many questions as we can with the time permitting. In the wake of the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Tony McDade, and countless other black men, women, and children, it is clear that from protests around the world that we are in a moment where to be silent is to be complicit. We will hear from a diverse group of leaders from the broader AAPI community who have come together to reiterate in a unified voice that AAPI solidarity means Black Lives Matter. We will hear from members of Congress about the work that is being done and a call to all of us uh, to spring into action. We will also hear from AAPI community leaders in Minnesota to share an important perspective from the locally impacted community. Finally, we'll hear from other AAPI community leaders and their own call to action in their own communities and how it is important for all of us to come together. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, Congresswoman Judy Chu. Congresswoman. Thank you. Thank you to the National Council of Asian Pacific Americans for organizing this important press conference. Our country is in terrible pain and my heart is heavy thinking about the raw anguish we are seeing due to the plague of police violence against black Americans. And the hearts of so many Asian American Pacific Islanders or AAPIs across the nation is heavy as well. That is why as chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, which includes 76 members of Congress from all across the nation, I have issued a statement condemning the murder of George Floyd and the need for justice. And that is why I organized a press conference of our tri caucus and Native Americans in Congress uh, to express our unity in denouncing this murder. And that is why I stand here with an unprecedented number of over 200 different AAPI organizations across the nation who've issued statements to show their solidarity with the Black community during this painful time. We join our brothers and sisters in the Black community in demanding justice and change. Yesterday, because of the incredibly multi-ethnic protesters who are outraged and who've taken to the streets, because of the people who said enough is enough, the officer who killed George Floyd was finally charged with second degree murder. And the three other officers involved in this case, including the Asian American officer of Hmong descent, have now been charged with aiding and abetting murder. And this is only right. This is because what happened to George Floyd was a murder. And were it not for the video of the incident, his murders would have gotten away with it. The lie that Mr. Floyd had resisted arrest would have prevailed and another black man's death at the hand of the police would have been dismissed or forgotten. But the video that exposed the lie was so shockingly explicit. We saw a police officer killing a man so nonchalantly, hand in pocket, refusing to remove his knee from George's neck. We heard George and bystanders pleading with the officers to let him breathe. We saw the three other officers doing nothing to stop this, aiding and abetting the crime. And we saw the life go out of George Floyd right before our very eyes. We cannot tolerate modern day lynchings where Americans are being killed simply for the color of their skin. Freddie Gray, Eric Gardner, Michael Brown, Breonna Taylor, Philando Castile, and countless others before them died similarly unjustifiable deaths at the hand of the police, and yet the police were not held accountable. So today we are calling for justice, we are calling for accountability, we are calling for change. So to those peaceful protesters using their First Amendment right to assemble and demand a country that treats all lives equally, we say you are not alone. Although our experiences are different, the AAPI community is painfully familiar with decades of oppression and inequality. From the Chinese Exclusion Act, which denied equality for 60 long years to people like my grandfather, to the shameful imprisonment of innocent Japanese Americans during World War II, 
to the rise in anti-Asian hate crimes we have witnessed due to coronavirus, AAPIs know the sting of racial prejudice as well. In fact, earlier this year, AAPIs across this nation were terrified with the rise of anti-Asian coronavirus hate crimes and incidents in which innocent AAPIs were targeted with racism and violence, including a two-year-old who was stabbed at Sam's Club in Texas. There have been over 2,000 reported hate incidents like this now. And that's why I was so grateful earlier this year when my colleagues in the Congressional Black, Hispanic, and Native American caucuses came together to denounce these anti-Asian coronavirus hate crimes and incidents and helped us to fight back. And we as AAPIs must make sure that we are not only asking people to show up for us, but that we are willing to do the same for them. Our unity is our strength. Now more than ever, we must stand united to address systemic inequality and racial injustice in our nation. And we must come together to heal as a nation and work to ensure that all Americans, regardless of their race, feel safe and have equal justice under the law. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. Next, it is my honor to introduce to all of you a true champion for the AAPI community. She has fought tirelessly for US veterans. She is the founding co-chair of the Environmental Justice Caucus as well, representing the state of Illinois, Senator Tammy Duckworth. Senator. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me on today. And to um, Congresswoman Chu, um, my friend, thank you for organizing this. This was so wonderful of you to pull this group together. And I couldn't agree with you more, the emphasis on us uh, AAPIs coming together as a community, not just to stand up for our own community, but to be the best allies we possibly can for our black and brown uh, uh, neighbors and, and, and the folks who are truly experiencing the um, really the most negative treatment by our law enforcement uh, to this day. Um, you know, we, we, we're in a country for the last three years where the president has done everything he could to divide us. And as Judy mentioned um, earlier this year, uh, the Trump administration time and again sought to demonize Asians by calling COVID-19 the Wuhan virus, uh, the Chinese virus, resulting in so many Asian Americans, especially those of East Asian descent, being targeted for hate crimes and negative comments. It's one thing to go after um, grown uh, you know, adults, but for children, such as a two-year-old to be stabbed, such as a 13-year-old being pulled off of his bike, um, is really shameful and, and downright criminal. Um, we also, in our community, understand the decades of discrimination now, I will be the first to say that in my own life, I have a lot of privilege to include, as I watched um, Mr. Floyd die, that horrible, horrible gut-wrenching video, and I heard him call out that he needed to take a breath, that he could not breathe, and then for him to call for his mother who had passed away two years previously. It, was, it gutted me as a mom, and I knew that because of my privilege, I will never have to sit down with my two daughters and teach them to beware of the police, to beware of police, potential racism and bias among the police forces against them. I will not have to teach my daughters like so many black mothers have to teach their children and especially their sons, how to act, where to put your hands, how to de-escalate when you are encountering law enforcement in case you are suspected of a crime, even though you're doing something as simple as going for a run, uh, if you're doing something as simple as driving your car down the street. In Illinois, we had um, a young woman by the name of Sandra Bland, uh, who ended up dying in a Texas jail um, because she was pulled over and she was arrested for improper lane change because she did not use her turn signal. Um, she did not have anyone in her life that she could call for that $500 bail. And she ended up dying in that prison cell because they would not listen to her cries for help that she had a health issue and she needed to see a doctor. Well, you know, when we went back and re-looked at the police cam video uh, footage, it turned out that she had not committed the crime of improper lane change. And so she died in a Texas jail and she was there because of her poverty and the color of her skin. We can and must do better in this country. That is why as AAPIs, 
while we are fighting for equality and justice and to end racism for all Americans, we also must stand up and be the best allies that we can be for Black Americans in particular, because they are the ones that are the biggest victims of the inherent racism and injustice that is in our judicial system. It's why I wrote um, the police, uh, um, my, my, criminal just, my criminal justice reform legislation to include my police training an independent review act that provides for funds for training for police forces on inherent racism and inherent biases, but also includes um, a requirement for independent reviews of police involved shootings and police involved deaths so that no longer will we have the same police forces, the same local prosecutors um, investigate themselves when these issues come up. Um, we have a lot of work to do uh, and, and these issues will continue to reoccur. Um, but we are, I think, at an inflection point. Um, we can do this without this president. We can, as a nation, come together and heal our wounds and stand up with each other. And so I support the peaceful protests that are happening all across this country right now. And I say to those who are taking advantage of the peaceful protests uh, to conduct criminal activities, stop. You're not helping anyone. And we are watching out for you. And we will not let you continue. Those who are taking advantage in a criminal way when various, the largest majority of people are peacefully pr protesting and they are talking about the anger and the hurt and the betrayal that they have felt in their lives from the minute that they were old enough to walk, um, that they have been targets because simply of the color of their skin. So thank you for letting me be on this call. I'm happy to um, uh, be part of this wonderful group. And I thank the, uh, uh, the Aspire Caucus and I everybody for stepping up and um, not only speaking up about the need for um, uh, to fight racism against Asian Americans, but also for all of us, because we are as a country so much stronger, so much better, um, so much more true to our values and ideals that our founding fathers um, wrote about when we, are do when we do it together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator. I'd like to now introduce Bao Bang, the President and CEO of Hmong National Development. Bao? Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Senator Duckworth, and my colleagues of the API community. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and share with you all stories of injustices that we witnessed in Minnesota and why we need to come together with a unified voice to demand for justice and real change. My name is Bao Wang, and I'm the President and CEO of the Hmong National Development, a subsidiary of Hmong American Partnership, which is a local-based social services organization in St. Paul, Minnesota. H&D's mission is to empower the Hmong community to achieve prosperity and equality through education, research, policy advocacy, and leadership development. We exist to create a united, thriving Hmong community. And as an organization, we stand with our Black community in demanding justice, in holding accountable those who killed George Floyd. We are heartbroken that our justice system continues to fail black and brown communities. And we recognize that anti-blackness within our community contributed to George Floyd's death. As a Hmong organization, we have been vocal about the deep systematic, uh, systemic uh, inequalities that pri privileges one race over another. George Floyd's death reminds us of the centuries of old racism that existed to separate and divide a collective voice for justice. Our history and experiences are different from our black brothers and sisters. However, we share one common enemy and that is the, the enemy of oppression. Centuries ago, it was oppression that led us to leave China and dispersed throughout Southeast Asia. It was oppression that made us lead a war-torn country during the Vietnam War. And it is oppression that divided us and created our dias diasporic um, experience. It is oppression that divides us as a community and it is the Hmong National Development's role to unite among community in solidarity with their communities, no matter their country or origin. In this past week, the country was witness to the violence that destroyed so many Twin Cities neighborhoods and businesses. And as Minnesotans, we watched our beloved city burned to the ground. So many of the 25,000 community members that we serve live and work in the communities that were hit the hardest, South and North Minneapolis, the East side of St. Paul and our fractal neighborhood of St. Paul. We watched the businesses that we helped to get back on their feet during COVID-19 pandemic 
only to see them looted, destroyed, and burned to the ground. We listen to and cry along with our Hmong businesses owner as they share their journey of their American dream and only to have all their life savings go, gone in an instant. We saw that terror in our refugee community members who spoke about reliving their trauma when many of them had to evacuate their homes in a moment's, in a moment's notice. For those who choose to stay in their homes, we heard about their need to protect their family and their properties. And many who did not have a gun went out to purchase one. We were told how many more wars do we need to go through to find peace? There are many more stories to share and many more people who are impacted by the system of oppression. As an organization, we exist to fight the system does not, that does not value lives, especially black lives. We know that the destruction of buildings and properties are a symptoms of a deeper systemic issue. Every day my staff wake up roll up their sleeves and collectively fight against the system. We are on the ground working along with community to build a vibrant Minnesota and we need policies that will rebuild our community for and by our community. In 1863, Abraham Lincoln said, we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. Centuries later, we are still fighting that great civil war. We are battling a war with racism and oppression, and it has surfaced the racism pandemic we bear witness to in the death of George Floyd, Freddie Gray, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Breonna Taylor, and Philando Castile, and so many others who have died at the hands of police. We say their names because they matter. We say their names so that we do not forget the enormous task ahead in our fight for their justice. Martin Luther King Jr. says, now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. And as an organization, this is why we stand united right now because our country's task is long overdue and our nation's policies are obsolete. We are elevating our voices so that new policies and systems can lead us towards this transformative change that we are seeking. Thank you. Thank you, Bao, so much. Um, our next speaker is Bo Tal Urabe, Executive Director of the Coalition of Asian American Leaders based in Minnesota. Bo. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, NCAPA and KPEC, for inviting us to uh, join the press conference today. Um, my name is Bo Tal Urabe, and I'm the Executive and Network Director for the Coalition of Asian American Leaders here in St. Paul, Minnesota. We are a social justice network that has over 3,000 Asian Minnesotan leaders who work with us day in and day out to build uh, Minnesota that can work for everybody. Uh, this past week and a half has been trying for all of us across the country, but especially here in Minneapolis and St. Paul. As the world now knows, on May 25th, George Floyd, a black man, a community member and resident of Minneapolis was killed by police officer Derek Chauvin, who was aided by three other officers. That's why we applaud Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison for also charging the remaining three officers in aiding and abetting in causing the death of George uh, Floyd. One of the officers um, that stood watch as Mr. Floyd died is Officer Tutau. Many debated about whether it matters that Tu Tao is Asian American, Hmong American. I say it does. To watch someone who looks like us behave as a bystander in the killing of a black man is devastating because he was complacent in a system that is racist. It is a reminder that our people don't just need jobs. We also must choose our role in confront confronting and upholding oppression. The fact that there are even uh, that there's even this conversation about our role, and that some feel we must pick between Black lives or Asian lives, is a prime example of how white supremacy works. There's a belief that Asian and Black communities cannot work together, but we know from history that we have fought together. And in fact, when African Americans fight for justice equality and freedom, it also benefits us as Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. 
whether it's five years ago or 200 years ago from Fong Li, a Hmong American also killed by the police, Minneapolis police, to other Asians who have been excluded, profiled, detained, and deported, one thing is clear. Our current criminal justice layered with other oppressive systems has never worked for us. These structures have kept us from really thriving. And while Asians have been rewarded for our assimilation into whiteness with the lie of the model minority myth, it is at times like this when there are layered oppressions that we must remember that our status is always conditional and subject to being taken away by xenophobia. We will continue to be in unity and solidarity with black leaders here in Minnesota and across the country to demand that we fundamentally transform our racist systems, starting with our criminal justice system. It might feel hard to imagine a world without policing, but we must. This past week, as white supremacists inserted themselves into the movement and roamed our streets, burned our buildings and shot at our residents, the police weren't out protecting our communities. What I saw on the ground was that block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood, community members came together to protect each other. A world beyond policing is possible and we stand together with black communities to, to demand transformative change because America is not great till it is great for everyone. Yes, Asian Minnesotan families and businesses were hurting because of COVID-19 and some have sustained additional damages because of the uprising. We are not overlooking that and have been driving our organization's resources to support our people, as well as actively ensuring that Asian Americans are able to participate in liberation work and are included in policy and resource distribution con uh, conversations that are happening right now. Things have been difficult in Minnesota but it's also been hopeful. Minnesotans throughout the state are coming together to demand justice for George Floyd, to say Black Lives Matter. And when I've been at protest, delivering supplies or boarding up businesses, I've seen that this is now a movement that is diverse in age and race led by Black leaders. I'll end by seeing, saying that this is our moment to not just dream big, but to push forward in solidarity we will continue working with black leaders in our communities to fight for and build the world that we deserve. So I hope all of you will as well. Thank you. Thank you, Bo. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Tavai Samwalu, Executive Director of Empowering Pacific Islander Communities. Tavai. Thank you, Greg. Malo lava lepa ia malema malu ilitato ne maftanga. My manga te tele se yo o i tato fa nawiti ta lofa. O te whawhitai mō le nei awanoa, o ma whai ona tu lai i tō tō numa, ma whai lau tau tautanga. I opened in Samoan to be, as Toni Morrison says, in conversation with my people. My only regret is that I don't have all of the languages of Oceania, and I still hope to call in each and every member of the Pacific Islander community. E i loa le tangata i lana tu, savali, Nofo matautala. A Samoan proverb that states that a person is known by the way they stand, walk, sit, and talk. It will tell you what villages they're from and who they're accountable to. If you will know me by my stance, then let me be clear that I stand in defense of Black lives with protesters who have said simply and loudly, stop killing Black people. If you will know me by my walk, then I walk with Movement for Black Lives, who have led a week of action, laying out a clear pathway to a better future, demanding one, respect for the rights of protesters, two, divestment from police, three, immediate relief for the Black community, four, community control, and today, a demand to end the war against Black people. As a colonized people who are often recruited to enforce systems, Pacific Islanders have a particular role to play in ending this war. Pacifica siblings, I say this with the deepest of love, that they will call you warriors 
and weaponize your bodies for a white supremacist agenda investing in your death. I'll remind you that you are also healers and protectors. And I will demand that you live. Sent, you know, just standing closer to whiteness has never saved us. We can never trust the leadership of those who seek to dominate. Do not forget that the opposite of oppressed is not oppressor. It is liberated and liberator. If we must sit, may we sit listening to Black community in deep reflection of our long Pacifica history of solidarity with and learning from Black movements, the debts we owe. What does it mean to consume Black culture without committing to the protection of Black people and their livelihood? It's a contradiction of our most deeply held cultural value of reciprocity. Last night, Dr. Jamaica Osorio reminded me of the importance of genealogy to our people, that everything and everyone has a past that informs our futures, that anti-Blackness and policing is part of our colonial inheritance, that not only is a world without policing possible, that we've been there and we've known it and existed long before. And that a recalling of our cosmologies should not only uproot anti-Blackness, but also untether us from institutions that are designed to kill us. If you will know me by my talk, then I will say her name. Pamela Turner, Sandra Bland, Brianna Taylor, Corinne Gaines, Atatiana Jefferson, Chantel Davis, and Nina Pop. Bless the names that I do not know. Bless those we may never know because they've been misgendered and the violence against them continues even beyond their death. May my every movement as an uninvited guest on this stolen and occupied Tongva land show you that I am from many villages. I was born in diaspora of a village steeped in oppression and my survival in it, and my entry point and awakening to freedom was black activism. My most audacious dreams of liberation are shaped by black thought from Angela Davis to Octavia Butler. This statement is an invitation to hold me and this organization accountable for when we fall short of our commitment to ending anti-Blackness and realizing Black liberation. I recognize that solidarity is not a philosophical project. It is consistent, visible, and measurable action. This way towards and until freedom. Thank you. Thank you, Tabai. Next, I'd like to introduce Lakshmi Sridharan, Executive Director of South Asian Americans Leading Together. Lakshmi. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. It's an honor to be here today with NCAPA colleagues and KPAC leadership. And thank you to everyone who has gone before me today in this press conference. Um, I'm Lakshmi Sridharan with South Asian Americans Leading Together. And I was born and raised in Georgia, which is where I'm tuning in from now, not too far from where Ahmed Arbery was murdered by a former white police officer. In 2013, Malcolm X grassroots movement reported that police officers, security guards, or self-appointed vigilantes kill a black man every 28 hours. And seven years later, we have not done enough to address this unacceptable reality. Since last week's murder of George Floyd, people have taken to the streets in protest in cities across the US, demanding to live in a world where the police stop killing black people with impunity. And instead of committing to this, some elected officials have deployed military violence on protesters. Within our South Asian community, we know that many of our community members are both willing and sometimes perhaps unaware of the extent of their own anti-Blackness, but we can no longer afford to be unaware. It is unacceptable. Our history has been purposefully fragmented from us as communities of color, but it is on us as Asian Americans to put those pieces back together. We must remember that many of us would not be here were it not for the history of the Black-led civil rights struggle that was also very violently repressed by our government. 
And we must also remember that as non-Black people of color, we have benefited and even profited from the institutionalized racism in this country. And as a pan-South Asian organization, our role is to both interrogate our reliance on systems that are rooted in white supremacy and anti-Blackness like the criminal justice system, but to examine how we are also perpetuating anti-Blackness. As a community, we must carefully look at our own reliance and belief in policing and the police as we address the hate violence aimed at our own communities, which has been on the rise in response to COVID-19. Our allies at Equality, La uh, Equality Labs and Desi's Rising Up and Moving have challenged South Asians, particularly those of us who are upper caste, to confront casteism, Islamophobia, and Hindu nationalism within our own communities in our efforts to demonstrate solidarity with Black communities. This is our work to do, and we must not only commit to it now during a flashpoint, but long term to truly transform our systems of injustice. And while we've been heartened by the solidarity that so many in our communities have already expressed, like Rahul Dubey, who sheltered at least 70 protesters in his home in DC, and Ruhel Islam, a Bangladeshi restaurant owner in Minneapolis who said, let my building burn, justice needs to be served. We must also hold the truth that the grocery store whose staff called the cops on George Floyd and the police officer who stood by and did nothing to stop the death of George Floyd are also members of our community. That is why, most importantly, we must support Black-led movements, organizations, and their demands. This moment is not about us. The Movement for Black Lives platform, like Tavai said, and I'll repeat here, includes six pillars. End the war on Black people, reparations for past and continuing harm, divestment from police and investment into Black communities, economic justice, community control, and political power. We must actively commit to all of these, and at SALT we are dedicated to providing our community members with the resources and information they need to be able to materially support this, because our own liberation is inextricably linked to meeting those demands. Thank you. Thank you, Lakshmi. And at this point, if there are any members of the press would like to ask a question, uh, feel free to indicate in the chat box. Um, I didn't see any, and so I want to give a moment in case anyone wants to chime in. Very good. Then in closing, thank you all for attending and thank you for the viewers who joined us as well. Uh, I want to recognize that while there have been members of NCAPA present at today's press conference, uh, beyond that, the other 30, 30 plus members are also doing work to make sure that the API community is heard loud and clear that we stand in solidarity with the Black community. Uh, whether it's Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AHAC, or the Sick American Legal and Defense Education Fund, uh, JACL or OCA, all of our members, it, it's been heartening to see us all come together and discuss this and figure out ways in which we can stand in support of the Black community during this difficult time. And I want to say that we're ready to fight side by side for meaningful change. To the API community members watching, joining in this fight does not mean forsaking our own. White supremacy is the common denominator in the oppression of all communities of color. And we must challenge ourselves to confront our own maintenance of this system that by design aims to divide us. It requires our misdirected rage and systemic racism flourishes when we lose sight of the fact that our struggles are inextricably linked. This doesn't diminish or ignore the pain and tension that exists between the AAPI community and the black community all over the country. But the kind of progress that we all want requires small acts of courage, small acts of trust, that when we fight for others and fight together, we're all better for it. Thank you, everyone. And we will now conclude this press conference.